Life is not a dress rehearsal. Make it count. Don't let yourself make excuses for not doing the things you want to do. That's Sam Altman. Hey, welcome to the show. My name is Roger Whitney. I am your host. I'm excited you're here. Now, this show is dedicated to helping you not just survive retirement, but rock retirement. And having the confidence to rock retirement is really what it's all about. Having the confidence that you can navigate this crazy, uncontrollable journey, which is very intimidating at times. And the way you're going to have that confidence, I think, is going to be by mastering the fundamentals that you need to practice over and over and over again as you walk this journey. And that's what this entire month is about on the show. Now, last week, we talked about the how do you do it, the agency. How do you control the controllables? And we argue that you should use a more very agile approach, which will help you not get so intimidated by all the things you got to think about and identify little baby steps you can take to improve your journey. Because this is a practice. This is not something that you can actually get done. It's a practice, just like being a parent is a practice. You just keep iterating and doing and doing. And it's all about controlling the controllables. And I just finished a book, my first book for March, Wooden, by uh, John Wooden and a co-author. I can't think of his name, but it's a collection of John Wooden's writings. If you're not familiar with him, he was the UCLA head basketball coach for decades, I think 50s, 60s, 70s. And during that time, they won 10 national championships, seven of them in a row in the 70s. Incredible. And Wooden's philosophy really jives well with controlling the controllables, which is what you need to do fundamentally. His philosophy was he didn't really do a lot of research on the opposing team or scouting or matchups or the arena. He focused, and the reason he didn't is because he knew he couldn't control any of those things. He focused on preparing his team for a game, making sure they're conditioned and that they are as prepared as they can be, and then showing up and executing to the full ability that they could in that moment. And if he felt confident that that occurred, he didn't really care about the score. He didn't care about championships. In fact, he was more proud of teams that didn't get championships because of their ability and commitment to preparing and performing. He would argue that even one minute spent thinking about something that you don't have any control over is a minute wasted that you could have spent focusing on something you have control. And that's the essence of what agile retirement management is. So we talked about that last week because that will give you agency which is one of the three components you need to have hope that you can prosper in retirement. So we need to have agency. We talked about that last week. This week, we're going to talk about another component, which is to have an inspiring goal for a future state of yourself, an inspiring goal for your future. You need to have that. And then the rest of the month, we're going to talk about having pathways to get to that goal where you can exercise your agency. If we can have these three things, fundamentally, we're going to be well on our way to rocking retirement. And that's what I want for you. So this week, we're going to focus on having a compelling vision for your future. Who do you want to be when you grow up is a difficult question when you're 50 or 60. Yeah, it's hard when you're young, but you don't know anything. You're not really that good at anything when you're young. When you're in your 50s and 60s, like you are, you have a lot of competency in a lot of different domains. You have a lot of interests of things you would like to try or things that you're good at. And what ends up happening for you in a normal retirement planning process is you feel like when I set my retirement goals, I've chosen. And that's intimidating because if you choose and you choose wrong, you don't have a lot of time to make it up. And that can paralyze us in creating an inspiring goal for our future in retirement. Well, I'm here to tell you, don't worry about it because you're going to change your mind a million times. I can pretty much guarantee that. Having walked this journey with so many people over decades, looking back at what their initial goals were to where they are now, seeing all the turns in the road, some chosen, some not, your life is going to unfold in so many different ways that the plan is going to change. 
I can tell you that. So when you set these goals down, and it can be intimidating because then you look at it in a spreadsheet, don't you? And it's like 30 years of cash flows. It looks permanent. Realize that all of that is erasable and it's going to change. So it's better to have a plan than to sit there and noodle and noodle and noodle on what is the exact right plan because there isn't one. You're going to change your mind a million times. So give yourself some grace there. This paradox of choice can paralyze us. But it is, who do you want to be when you grow up? That question will never end. Now, there's a couple roadblocks other than this paradox of choice I want to mention. And then we'll talk about how I would suggest you go through figuring out this compelling vision for yourself. The next roadblock is going to be how your life is organized right now. Now, here you are in your 50s and 60s. You likely live in an area because of your parents, school district, or your job. You have to work near your job because you don't want to have a crazy commute. And then you're settled there because you have, if you have children anyway, you're settled there because you have school districts, etc. Your life is organized around your work and commute and community. Well, when you retire, most likely your children are gone if you have them, but your commute goes away and you really can organize your life in any way, anywhere that you want. And that's exciting, but sometimes we don't recognize that because we can't get our mind out of where we are because we're inside our own little bottle. We don't see perspective. Well, I just will live here, I assume, when you could perhaps live in the Bahamas if you wanted to, or in Colorado, or in Florida. So I think thinking about your life with a fresh plate, a clean plate, is something we want to try to strive for, because we're naturally going to be, our minds are going to be confined to what is. The second roadblock, I guess it's the third, that I want to talk about in, is being stuck in the accumulation mindset. So here's the deal. When you start your job and you get your first paycheck, that is powerful. I can go buy my own baseball cards, mom. I don't need your money. I can go buy my own. That's power. And then as you develop that power and earn income, I can pay my own rent. I know my daughter, she is very proud that she is independent of us financially. And then you advance in your career. You buy the house, you buy your things, you invest, you have excess money, And you see that money grow in your 401k and your IRAs or wherever. And now I make money, I pay my way, and I add money over here and I get to update my net worth statement and it grows and grows and grows. Wow, this is awesome. I am the captain of my universe. That's intoxicating. And so here you are in your 50s and 60s, you've built up your net worth, your assets relative to your liabilities, and you have status. People respect you at your job. You pay your own way. That is intoxicating. It's very comforting. And this can prevent you from thinking about life outside of work. We call it overcoming frugality on one aspect of it, because when you retire, you lose your paycheck, and you're supposed to use all this deferred income that you saved and grew to help provide for your life and your own paycheck. That's uncomfortable, because now we don't see our balances just go up and up and up by our work. We see them level off or maybe go down because we're accessing those funds to provide for our life. Some people can't overcome that frugality and can't get themselves to actually harvest because they're afraid of losing it and having nothing, or they don't get that positive affirmation of it growing or being there. We're going to have to get over that a little bit if we want to rock retirement because this is what the money was for. Obviously, you got to be a good steward about it. That's why you have to have a good pathway but we don't want to end up with some of the things that we're going to talk about. The last roadblock I want to talk about is thinking that rocking retirement or having a great life is that tomorrow is the day. Tomorrow's not the day. You know what day it is? Today. Today is the day. It's easy to deny your life. How do you rock retirement or have a great life? The only way you do that is by having a great life and rocking it today. All rocking retirement is, is a string of days where you're showing up and making today the day. Yeah, when I retire, I'm going to get, I'm going to work on my health. I'm going to start exercising a little bit, paying attention. So I'm excited to do that in retirement. Yeah, in retirement, we're going to start traveling with my spouse. You know, we haven't gone a lot of places. That's what, something we're really excited about. Yeah, we're going to do that in retirement. Oh, oh yeah, I know I got four weeks of vacation, but we're going to do that in retirement. It's going to be awesome. Today's the day. 
because tomorrow isn't promised to you. I had a call the other day, actually about a week, I guess about a week ago. It was a hard day that day. And this was the last call of the day. And I had a small appointment with someone who just needed to deal with this, uh, an issue. And it was on the calendar. And so we get on the phone. I'm like, hey, man, how you doing? He's like, I, I had, I, I slept like two hours last night. And I'm like, oh, geez, what happened? Well, he says, about four o'clock in the morning, my spouse had a massive heart attack. And she had had health issues, but massive heart attack. She's in the hospital. They did surgery. She's still questionable. We think if it, if it turns the right direction, things could actually be better than they were before physically, but it's still somewhat touch and go. And so you could hear the stress, the emotion in his voice. So he says this and I'm thinking, dude, why are you talking to me? And he said, well, I just got home. I actually didn't think it. I said it. He said, I just got home. I had to get a, a few hours sleep and I knew we had this on this calendar and I didn't want to miss it. And we put the issue aside and chatted for maybe 15 minutes or so, just about my life, right? life and how she was doing, how he was doing. I tried to love on them best I could. Today is the day. Think of Dom's story from a few months ago. And this is when we're creating a vision for our future, we think about it as the future, but really it comes back to what do we do today? And I'm going to talk about that in the approach that you think about this compelling vision. And I harp on this a lot because I see it a lot and I see sometimes the consequences of it a lot. And I don't want that for you, but that's a roadblock that it's tomorrow and it's not, it's today. Okay. Three ways, I think a three-step process you want to think through in creating this vision for your future. So now that we know what the roadblocks to creating an inspiring goal or vision for retirement, there are three basic ways that I think of in terms of actually fleshing out what that, those goals are. Now, the third way is the one that we most think of when we think of retirement planning, and that is putting numbers to spending goals. I need X amount to spend every single year. I want to spend X amount on travel every other year. I want to buy this or that. And we definitely need to use that process to operationalize and actually do retirement planning from the financial perspective. But I think it would be wise to at least spend a little bit of time thinking about what you want outside of the financial realm, because that should be what informs the financial realm. Because the fundamentals of planning are going to be, you want to create a vision that inspires you, and then you want to make that vision feasible, and then you want to make it resilient. So what is going to make your retirement amazing? Well, one way you can go about that from the qualitative side is a process called regret minimalization, which is essentially, hey, I'm sitting here at 60. I got 30 years ahead of me. I have ideas of what I want, but why don't I talk to people or listen to people that have already gone on this journey and figure out what they regret doing, what they wish they would have done differently. And that way I can learn the wisdom from those people so I can minimize those same regrets in my life. I think that's a interesting approach to consider because it doesn't get you bogged down in all the dollars and cents so much. And there are plenty of sources that you can go to. There are articles that have been written in books, probably people in your life that you can turn to. Definitely in the club, we have people asking others that are gone before them what they wish they would have done differently. What I refer to a lot is in my personal life, but also on the show is a book by Bronnie Ware, and we've talked about it often, called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And I think this is a great book to hear some wisdom from people at the end of life, looking back and reflecting on what they wish they would have done differently. And Bonnie Ware was a hospice nurse for decades in Australia, and she just started to pay attention. And then she wrote a book off of her observation. So I'll read you The Top Five Regrets. And I think using a tool like this might help you think about your life differently so you can figure out how you might minimize these in your life. The top five regrets, according to Brody Ware, are, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Regret number two is, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Number three, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Number four, I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. And regret number five is I wish I had let myself be happier. 
So can you hear some of those regrets in some of the roadblocks that we talked about? I think of uh, number two, I wish I hadn't let myself work so hard. Well, part of the reason why those regrets come about are because early on, when we're facing this uncertain future of retirement, working an extra year just feels safer. And what has happened, and I've seen this in my own practice, as people age and they get older and older, they realize, oh man, I'm going to have enough money. And then they start to regret what they could have done. Or I wish I would have allowed myself to be happier. Now that you can go a lot of different ways with that one. But one way you could think about that is allowed myself to treat myself or to spend money on experiences for family. So I think this regret minimalization approach might be helpful as you think about your life and creating this inspiring vision for yourself. The second way that's qualitative is this whole concept of self-actualization. And this is more of a stoic type of philosophy when you think about what you want for your life. So it goes like this. Imagine you're on your deathbed and you're alone in a room, lights are dim, and the door opens, and someone walks in, and they look pretty familiar to you, but you can't quite make them out. And they have this vibrance about them, this glow about them, this charisma. And as they get closer, you realize that this person is your fully actualized self, and you are confronted with who you are and who you could have been. So that mental picture is part of the thinking about self-actualization as to how do I be as full of who I am and close the gap of that potential and who you are so at the end of life, you can look at that gap and make it as small as possible. So rhymes a little bit with regret minimalization. And this focuses on establishing your values. What values d- drive you? And this is an exercise that we've done on the show before. I'm looking for my little plaque here. Where is my plaque? Have I lost my values? I have a plaque with my top 10 values. Uh, where is it here? I've been reorganizing. Hmm. I can't find it. That's, I'm going to have to take care of that. But when you, if you set what your values are of who you are at your best, like for me, I love to continually improve. Self-improvement is a value. Adventure. I am more fully who I am when I am adventurous. So if you can establish your top values, and we have a worksheet, we can share it in Six Shots Saturday, you can start to see, hey, I'm at my best when I exhibit these things and start to make that a daily habit and think about how you incorporate those things in your life so you can become more fully you. So those are two more qualitative ways of going about, and there are lots of different things you can do. One approach related to that is this idea of ample resources. Imagine you are financially secure and then you have more than enough money to take care of your needs now and in the future. And you're more than enough. You're not crazy rich, but you have pretty much to do whatever the heck you want. And then ponder, what would you do with your life? What would you do for yourself? What would you do for the ones you love? What would you do for others? Exploring these types of things tease out a compelling vision. These are questions that you can write on for a long time and work to discover if you choose to go down that path. Ultimately, though, you're going to want to take these qualitative things and bring them back down to something that's actionable from a financial perspective. And this is the one where I think most of us are more comfortable. And my suggestion would be we want to have very firm goals, a firm vision financially that we want to solve for. And we'll call those the needs. These are the base needs that you need to live the life of you. So that's going to include, obviously, keeping the lights on, your housing, your groceries, your food, electricity, etc. But you also want to include some light travel. You want to include some light entertainment. You want it to have a be a rich life that is non-negotiable. So this is firm. This is a need that you're going to need year by year to make sure you have the resources to cover. This is the basics that you're going to want to know. Then secondly, you're going to want to know what the wants are. 
Those are going to be the more discretionary things that bring flavor to your life. Those are going to be the travel, the toys that allow you to do adventurous things, the gifting, things that can come and go, and they're more jello-ish. They're not firm like the needs, those non-discretionary items. They're like jello. Some years you need, you want to get more of them than others, but you can always move them around easily. And we want to know what those are. And you're going to want to know when they start, what year do they start, how much you estimate it's going to cost, and how frequent those things will happen. So as an example, it could be travel. Well, the year I retire, I want to have a $10,000 travel budget for the rest of my life. Or maybe it's $10,000 every other year. Or it's $10,000 for the first 10 years and then it goes away. Those are the kind of frames that you want to have for that. But knowing that these things will come and go. And then lastly, you want to have wishes, which are these aspirational things. Wow, if I could have that lake house or that RV, or if I could establish a private foundation, that would be awesome. And whereas your needs are firm and your wants are jello-y, these are more fluid. They're just tests of what might be possible. And you want to start to frame what these things might be and then put some numbers to them. Now, the, here's where we can bog down on the number part. We definitely want to get precise over time, especially with the shorter term things. And this is part of being agile. If you try to get too precise too early, you really bog the process down. So my suggestion here from a fundamental standpoint when you're thinking about something is just swag it. A sophisticated, wildly awesome guess. Just take a wildly awesome guess and then through the little conversations or the iteration of being agile, you can start to dial them in more and more. So I think if you can think about your 100-year-old self and examine the regrets that you might have if you were to think what that person said to you, or look at the wisdom of others that have walked before you, or perhaps you want to think from a virtuous standpoint and try to live your virtues and your values each and every day, those can help start to frame, what do you want to be doing with your life? Who do you want to be when you grow up? And once you spend some time there with yourself and perhaps with your spouse or your partner, you can start to put some numbers to them. So I'll give you a quick example. And this is just my wife and I, because we were talking about this here about a month ago. Well, maybe not that long. We were saying, okay, where do we want to be five years from now? I'm not really looking to retire, but I want to know five years out, what would I like to see in my life? Professionally, energy-wise, and family-wise. So energy-wise, five years from now, I would like to be a very healthy, energetic man. That means I got to work on my eating. I got to work on my physical fitness and on my stretching. I want to have the energy to do things. Five years from now, I want to be more energetic than I am today in terms of having my habits dialed in. My wife feels the same. Work-wise, I want to be doing more of what I'm passionate about the teaching and the advising, but I want to have better boundaries and not say yes to everything. So I have more time freedom. That's something I'm working on. Love wise, I want to be close mentor to my son and my daughter. I want to be my wife's best friend and continue that journey. In five years, we think we want to have our home in Colorado and we imagine that we're going to live part time each place with ultimately living there full time. But we want to have those things in place in five years. And if you can think of your life in broad strokes that way and then slowly back into some actionable numbers, you're going to start to create a compelling vision that you can work towards. And that's the beginning of a lifelong process of taking little baby steps to starting to make it so. So next week, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about once you have this vision and you've put some swag numbers to it, How do we start to create pathways so you can actually get there? And if you want a real crash course on what we're just talking about, go back to listen to some of the retirement plan lives where we have some of those conversations. But this is fundamental and this is where everything starts because when you get this, getting the version of what you want, that inspiring goal and putting some numbers to it is really important because this is what we're trying to solve for. We're not trying to solve for all the outside optimization things. This is the main dish, the life that you want to live. So we want to always know what we think that is so we don't get distracted about solving for something else unintentionally. So with that, let's get to some listener questions. This show is sponsored by Boomer Benefits. They speak Medicare. Now, Boomer Benefits and Danielle Roberts, one of the founders, 
have been a friend of the show for a number of years, and they are who we turn to when we have someone trying to make Medicare decisions. And the cool thing about it is because of how Medicare is structured, this service is actually no cost to you. It's all baked into the Medicare program. So if you contact Boomer Benefits, they can help you evaluate what Medicare options are best for you based on your health and the the services that you use, and also review plans that you already have in place. And you can check them out at boomerbenefits.com forward slash R-A-M forward slash RAM, where they have a free report on five Medicare costs to plan for in retirement. Now it's time to answer some listener questions. If you have a question for the show, you can go to rogerwhitney.com forward slash ask Roger. Our first question comes from John. And John says, I wanted to reach out regarding last week's webinar. I saw that you were using a 4% expected return in your retirement planner. I've been using 7.5 for my 60, 40, 70, 30 stock to bond portions of my portfolio. I think a good number is critical to the plan. Can you provide some input on the 4% number? Why so low? So John is referring to the meetup we had at the end of January, which was the results webinar for our retirement plan live with Joel. And in that, we used the new retirement plus calculator, which is an online retirement calculator that we use in the Rock Retirement Club. And they have a couple different ways of doing it, John. And in fact, they use a pessimistic rate of 2% and an optimistic rate of 6%. So I'm not sure where the four came from. I didn't review the tape on that. But when they're using those percentages, or if you're entering a percentage in a spreadsheet, say, you do want to be careful. So I do agree with you that assumptions are important to a point, meaning that you're not going to have a great assumption. You just won't because there's just no way of forecasting what's going to happen in the future. In my private practice, we use historical data, which would lean more towards the number that you're talking about, seven and a quarter percent or so for a 60-40 portfolio over time. But we're doing Monte Carlo scenarios, meaning that we're also inputting the standard deviation and running multiple scenarios that show sequences of return where you actually get a lot worse or a lot better than the average. When you're dealing with linear returns in the sense of using a spreadsheet, where let's assume you're using a 7.5% return, John, and you're entering my return on my assets will be 7.5%, and you keep forecasting that out for the future, that's actually going to drastically overestimate your returns over time, especially, or your actually performance over time, especially if you have withdrawals in the mix, because you're constantly compounding at the 7.5%. In a linear fashion, in a retirement scenario, that's going to probably overstate the success of the plan. And in new retirements calculations, where they use the pessimistic of 2% and the optimistic of 6%, I think there's some hedging there because they realize that it's not a Monte Carlo scenario and they're just using a straight line assumption on returns. And I think that's reasonable enough to know whether you're on a safe path or not. I would say if you're constrained with using a linear type of approach, meaning a spreadsheet approach, you probably do want to skew a little lower on your return assumption than what the actual assumptions are because you're not factoring in the variability of returns. And just using the historical return as a constant could easily overestimate the plan. That said, and this goes to fundamentals of retirement planning, we want to be thoughtful in our assumptions, whether it's inflation or market returns in spending, but we don't want to worry too much about dialing them in and trying to get them very precise because there's so much static anyway that everything is going to change and it doesn't give us any more accuracy from a planning perspective. But we definitely want to avoid the big unforced errors. And I think using a linear return, you do definitely want to hedge on the lower side on the assumption that you're using. Our next question comes from Nancy, and it's related to a return assumption when we were talking about estimating required minimum distribution. So let's check out Nancy's question. Hi, Roger. This is Nancy, who asked the RMD calculation question from last week. My question for today is, why did you use 5% for an expected rate of return on the investment income? Also, does this 5% take into consideration inflation? I think that's it for now. Thanks again for 
answering my question and I was able to recreate your spreadsheet very easily. Keep up the good work. Well, great to hear from you, Nancy. And I'm glad, glad you're able to recreate the spreadsheet. So what Nancy's talking about is one thing that we want to do in the optimization phase is estimate what your required minimum distributions will be at age 72. That way we can get an idea of what those distributions might look like in the future to let us know whether there might be some tax planning strategies we want to do today. And so what I had suggested was if we assume you have a, let's say a million dollars in an IRA and you're 60 years old. Well, at 72, we know that you're going to have to start taking money out based off of the uniform life table that the IRS publishes. And so what I suggested was, well, if we have a million dollars today, let's just assume that it grows at 5% a year between now and then. And at age 72, apply the uniform life table that we have and calculate what the estimated required minimum distribution would be at that age. And so Nancy's asking, why did I use 5%? It's just a baseline estimate. There wasn't a lot of depth that went into it, Nancy, in terms of dialing in the right number, because there isn't a right number. We don't know how the assets are going to be invested, et cetera. So we were just trying to get a gauge for what those required minimum distributions might be so we can understand what that might do from a tax perspective to see if perhaps we should do withdrawals from IRAs or Roth conversions, et cetera. So there's not a lot of accuracy to that number. I think it's a reasonable number to use if you're forecasting out a portfolio for 12 years just for this purpose. You're welcome to use a 7%, 8% return assumption if you'd like. But again, it's not going to get you any more accuracy because we're assuming that tax code will be roughly the same when we're looking in our minds, when we're looking at that first year RMD, we're going to assume, oh, that's taxable income. And in our mind is going to revert to what we think taxes are as of today. Also, the uniform life table, that which calculates the percentage of your portfolio that you have to take out, that's going to update every single year. So we're not actually using the right uniform life table. We're just using the one for today. So I think it's important to be very detailed, but we also have to know when more detail doesn't get us more accuracy and for what we're trying to do for the job. So that was the logic of 5%. I think it's a reasonable rate if we're just trying to forecast the time value of money and where it will go to. You're welcome to use 7.5% or 6% if you'd like. What that will likely do is it will assume that it's going to grow faster, which will have your RMDs be bigger which might influence your decision-making. So choose one that you feel comfortable with. And I think the key here is, Nancy, and I think this goes back to John's last question when it comes to your return assumption. Once we make a reasonable assumption for the job that we're trying to do, we want to be very careful about changing those assumptions too often. Because if you start changing assumptions based on last year or our intuition about the future, the more we start to change these assumptions, the less we have any assumptions. Now we're just sort of making it up as we go along. So I think we choose a reasonable assumption for the job, and then we stick with that, knowing that that number is wrong. But then through little conversations where you're making little adjustments, you'll get too close to the same place without spending too much time on something you actually can't figure out. So hopefully that helps you understand why I chose that, and then you can adjust that to your liking. Our next question is from Morris regarding delaying required minimum distributions. So as we just stated, you have to take required minimum distributions at age 72. And Morris says, hey, Roger, I am 57 years old and plan to retire from my current federal job at age 62. I still plan to work part time in real estate past age 72. Is there any way I can delay taking required minimum distributions from my 401k at age 72? So Morris, the only tax advantage retirement account you can delay taking required minimum distributions from when you're 72 is the one for the business that you are currently active in. So as an example, let's assume, let's transport you 10 years into the future. Assume you have a business where you're contributing to your 401k and you also have an old 401k from a previous employer. Well, when you hit 72, for your active 401k, you can delay taking your required minimum distributions. However, your old 401k would still have that requirement set upon it, even though it's considered a 401k. Now, you might have the option 
in your current 401k to receive the rollovers from old 401k so you can consolidate it all into your active one, and that would help you with that issue. Now, a couple caveats here, Morris, is one is you want to make sure that the 401k that is active has that provision that allows you to delay your required minimum distributions. It's called a still working exception. So you want to make sure the 401k has that. And secondly, since you're in real estate and you're self-employed, you got to be a little bit careful because there are rules regarding businesses where you are the primary owner. So you're going to want to understand the ins and outs of those. That's a little bit too complicated to get into here. But yes, if you're active at a corporation and they have the exception for that active 401k, you can delay those required minimum distributions. Our next question or comment comes from Michael in regards to the Retirement Plan Live case study in January. Michael says, hey, Roger, I have been a big fan of your show for a while now. I was listening to the January theme with the profile on Joel and Mike and frankly was speaking out loud to myself while listening to the podcast on my walk. When I found out how much money she and Michael had in their portfolio, I was shocked I'm not sure what your process was in picking her situation, but her scenario is such a no-brainer that I was disappointed. Her potential yearly expenses after all her social capital is so tiny compared to her total assets. She has absolutely no worries. This is like a professional football team playing against a high school team worrying about whether they're going to win or not. When I heard how much assets she had, I became completely unmotivated to listen to the conclusion. Love your show, but next time pick a better scenario that's a bit more intriguing. First off, Michael, thank you so much for sharing your perspective. And I've heard this from a few, and I understand that from the financial perspective. It's very clear from a financial perspective that they were in great shape, are in great shape. So I'll give you a little understanding of how I pick them. So you at least have that. But first note, our next case study, I promise you will be a little bit more intriguing from the financial perspective. So when we review candidates for these case studies, and we do these every year, we try to hit different themes to give perspective. We try to have a single lady, a single man, married, recently married, second marriage, modest means, excessive means, you know, lots of means. We try to hit different themes to just keep giving different perspectives. And with Joel and Mike, the logic in picking them was not so much the financial part. You're right. It's not as intriguing. Will they make it or not? The reason for picking them was I wanted to explore someone that did a major transition in moving from one state to another in this case not knowing anybody in leaving their entire social and family network to be someplace new. That was the part that I thought was interesting, and I wanted to hear that perspective. Hopefully, I did a good job on that part of it, but I get your logic from the financial perspective. Now, I do think there's a lesson there on the financial perspective too, Michael, and I'm not sure of your situation and how intriguing yours is or whoever is listening here. But there is the understanding that we have to remember, Joelle was not 100% comfortable. She had some angst about their financial situation, even though I think she likely knew intellectually, oh yeah, we got this figured out. But she was printing off, screen capturing the value of her portfolio every single day and looking at the turbulence of the markets. And so it still was worrisome to her at some level, even if intellectually she knew, yeah, we got this. And I just heard this the other day. It's like if one man has a broken or two broken arms, it doesn't make your one broken arm or your splinter hurt any worse. So you live your own pain and your own worry and your own anxiety. And I'll be honest with you, many people whose financial worries are not that intriguing as to whether it will work or not, still fear the same angst. And I think that's part of why having a good foundational perspective can help people see this isn't that big a deal. We're fine. And help them relieve that pain, that emotional pain that comes without the perspective. Because you, from an outsider looking in, Michael, you're like, what are you talking about? This is easy. And you're right. But when you're on the inside, that worry can still be there. So 
we will work to hit the box to make sure it's a little bit more intriguing next time. But I appreciate your uh, input on that. So our last question for today comes from Alex on what to do with inherited IRA distributions. Hey, Roger, I've just discovered this show. I really enjoy listening to it. And I wanted to ask a quick question. I have an account, an inherited IRA that I need to take money out of. I've got 10 years to do so. My question is, I can take that money out. Let's say I take $30,000 out a year. I'll take that $30,000. That counts as income for the year. And then I want to do something with that 30 grand. So I can take that money and put it in a savings account, or I could take some of that money and put it into a Roth, but then I'm getting taxed again on that money. So I'm a little confused. So I'm wondering if you can help maybe clarify the question, which is, does it even make sense to do that with some of the money? Thank you very much. That's a great question, Alex. You have this inherited Roth and you're going to have to take out money. Let's call it 30,000 a year, whether you want to or not. It's going to be income. It won't be earned income, but it's going to be income where you're going to pay taxes on it. What are the five things you can do with money? Well, when you receive this $30,000, and let's assume that's what it is after tax, just to keep it simple, you could spend that money, Alex, on your lifestyle or something important to you or your family. You could save it as cash in terms of building up after-tax cash and that income cushion, perhaps for future retirement. You could give that money away and receive a deduction for a charitable contribution, or you could give it to family. You could pay down debt, or you could invest it. So those are the five things. I haven't found another one. Those are five things you can do with money. So you're receiving this $30,000. What is the best use of that money? Well, I think you'll get a lot farther in the answer to that, Alex, if you create the foundational plan of record that we're sort of building out how to do that or the things that go into it during this month. So maybe you work through some of this for yourself because that will give you a lot more clarity of what you do with that because perhaps you need to build a cash reserve because you're of a pending retirement or perhaps you need to invest that money or give it away. Now to your point of converting that to a Roth. So although you're going to receive that $30,000, it's not earned income. So you'll have to have earned income to get money into a Roth. So what I mean by that is if you receive the $30,000, you can contribute up to $7,000, assuming you're over 50, to a Roth IRA, but you're going to have to have earned income to allow you to make that Roth IRA contribution. So just because you've received the 30, you'll have to have some earned income from other sources in order to qualify to make a Roth contribution because you can't just simply convert it to a Roth. That's not allowed. And then you'll have to make sure that your income is below the income limits to be able to make a Roth contribution. And so you're not going to be taxed again if you make a Roth contribution because it's already assuming you have the earned income that allows you to do it. So essentially, if we assume you're not going to give the money away, you're not going to spend the money, you're not going to pay down debt, then you have two options. Do I save it as cash or do I invest it? So if it's save as cash or invest it, and you have earned income, it may make sense to move that to a Roth because you're not going to get taxed on the money because you have earned income that's allowing you to make the Roth contribution already. All you're doing is moving, in this case, $7,000 per year from a taxable account to a tax-free account. So it's just changing the categorization of future taxation. And so I would work through which one of those five things fit in your plan. Because it could simply be that you use this money to help fund, say, your retirement spending, which allows you to perhaps to keep monies elsewhere working longer for you because you don't have to take it out because you got this 30 grand coming in. So hopefully that helps clarify it, Alex. If not, shoot me a quick email and we'll take another swing at it. On your marks, get set. And we're off to take a little baby step you can take in the next seven days to not just rock life, but rock retirement. Create a compelling vision, a compelling goal of what you want in retirement. Think about your 90-year-old self and what they would counsel you and what they want you to do. And then use the retirement worksheet, which we'll share in Six Shot Saturday, to start to frame in what are my needs? What are some of those wants if I were to dream big? and put some swag numbers to those things. And if you have a partner or you're married, do them separately and compare your notes. If you could have everything, what would it be? Start 
working on that and thinking on that. And that will be your journey to creating a inspiring vision that you can apply your agency to making happen. All right. So next week, we're going to start working on how do we build pathways now that we have agency through agile and we're working towards a compelling vision that we're excited about. How do we build pathways to start to actually make it so? Hope you have a wonderful week. Hey, it's time for that all important disclaimer. We so appreciate you listening to the show and love your questions and love the teaching that we're able to provide here. And actually it helps us too, but remember you're not our clients. Not love it. If you took advice from yeah, us, on we, the would show. Not, we would not love it. If you took advice from us on the show, realize this is helpful in education, talk to your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before you make any decisions. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of retirement answer, man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance referenced is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.